At this time, uh, Representative Winkler is going to come up and give a retirement speech. So, Representative Winkler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, thank you for taking the time. I know you uh, uh, have sat around a long time today waiting for the Senate to get its work done. And I know that makes us all tired waiting for the Senate. Um, I just want to say uh, that tradition uh, would hold that I would stand before you and give a very generous uh, bipartisan speech in which I reveal my real affection for all of you on the other side, <laughs> my admiration, and to give a tearful farewell to this body. Uh, but I do not intend to follow that tradition. <laughs> Though I must say to Representative Garofalo, thank you for your earlier recognition to all of you for your kind words uh, today and in, in recent weeks. Uh, Mr. Speaker, some have said that I have been a sharp critic of the policies of the Republicans and of the GOP and that I have been at times uh, hard on uh, the Republican side of the aisle and members there. And I guess I would just like to say, first of all, that you deserved it. <laughs> all of it and more. <laughs> and uh, th though I start on a bit of a light note, uh, I did just want to bring, and I know that uh, this has had some discussion today, and while this is something that the Republican side is responsible for today, I do want to just take a minute to say that I think that there are limits to the kind of uh, way that we conduct ourselves on the floor. And I would ask uh, that if at times I have strayed over those limits, I want you to know sometimes it may have been on purpose, other times it may have been inadvertent, and I want to apologize if at any moment uh, you felt that I was uh, acting in some way that was not consistent with the standards of this body. It was certainly generally not my intention to do that. Um, this special session is a fairly peculiar end to a fairly uneventful legislative session. Uh, I think we would all agree that really we don't leave today uh, having changed the state of Minnesota or its budget tremendously from where we started back in January. Uh, for the members of my party, uh, the two years that we were in charge of this House, uh, we still have a lot of those accomplishments in place. Things like having raised taxes on the richest Minnesotans and balanced our budget and created a surplus. Uh, passing marriage equality and increasing the minimum wage, among others. Those achievements stand after this legislative session. And I also think that we can all be uh, uh, grateful and happy that so far we have not made the same mistake that legislators made in the late 1990s, which was to take good times and make long-term tax cut and spending decisions that drove us into deep deficits. And uh, even though I, was, uh, I would chastise the Senate earlier in this uh, evening, I must say that uh, Senator Bach and his caucus have really been strong in standing up for a healthy uh, budget reserve and making sure that our budgets are sound in years in the future. And uh, frankly, from our side of the aisle, I don't think there's anything much more progressive than we could, that we could do except to make sure that we are ready for the next downturn so that when the people of Minnesota need us, we are prepared to act. And I think that is a strong legacy of this legislative session as well. But leaving things as they are, uh, leaving the status quo, is really not a victory for anybody. And I hope nobody here thinks that this is a legislative session that can be characterized by its wins and losses. Um, so many of you know um, that we have, in our family, uh, decided to make a big move to Belgium. And the reason that we're doing this, and it's not a permanent move, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> but uh, we've, we're doing this in part because my wife had a tremendous personal and professional opportunity. She will be uh, general counsel and senior vice president for one of the largest hotel groups in the world, headquartered in Belgium. Uh, I like to say that she is my personal corporate overlord. <laughs> and she is a tremendously accomplished and able person. Uh, she is somebody who has built a strong career in a, in a profession that is based on language, and English is her second language. She is a native of Sweden, and she is a success in, that, uh, in a language that is not her own. Uh, and I'm very proud of her. But there's more to her story and our family's story than just that success. Uh, Jenny has uh, a couple of autoimmune diseases. Our son Isaac, who is eight, has type 1 diabetes. So does Jenny. She also has rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and she has a number of other uh, health conditions that make her success all that much more challenging and difficult to achieve in some ways. Uh, in fact, I just want to share a story. So 
when our third, when, she, when just when we found out we were pregnant with our third child, uh, is when my wife Jenny found out that she was, uh, she was, she had rheumatoid arthritis, and it so happens that all of the good medication to take while you have RA is uh, very bad for a developing fetus, and the one that you could take, which is a steroid, is really bad for controlling your blood sugars. So she was left in a position of having to basically go unmedicated with a very painful disease for months on end. Uh, you know, she, to the extent that she would drive to work and she couldn't grip the steering wheel of the car, she would try to drive with her wrists. Uh, we have two other kids and she had to take care of them along with me, of course. And so uh, she just, and she would, she would cry for hours in bed at night because she couldn't lay on her shoulder. And of course, I haven't personally been pregnant, but uh, it's my understanding that it's not all that comfortable to lie around. So under normal circumstances, she, she went through great pain and she was on bed rest for approximately eight weeks. After our uh, third son was born, she had two great weeks where she had no symptoms whatsoever. And then it came back, the pain came back with a vengeance thereafter. And she was very fortunate. She was fortunate because she had 14 weeks of paid family leave after she uh, had, the, had our third child, actually all three of them. And she did not have to make a decision about going to work versus taking, uh, and, and taking the medication that, would that she would need in order to work uh, and that would prevent her from being able to nurse our third child. So she made, we talked earlier tonight about difficult decisions that parents make. And Representative Schultz, uh, you talked a bit about that. And parents make really, have to make really hard decisions sometimes. So for Jenny it was, uh, when she would pick the baby up at night, she couldn't lift up with, his, with her hands because it was too painful. She lifted with her arms and was always afraid of dropping them. When she took the uh, two older boys to daycare, she had a choice between carrying the baby like that through the whole school or uh, hurting her hands all for the rest of the day by trying to just unlatch the car seat. Those are the kind of challenges that she faced and the kind of uh, tough decisions that she would have had to face about going back to work. And we were very fortunate that she worked for an employer that valued her. They valued her work as a family member and as a woman. And that is the kind of work, in my mind, that this legislative body and this state has in front of us. It is easy to talk about policy and to get into our little issues that we, that, and kind of narrow ourselves into our little focus areas. But really, I think we all believe that we should try to build an economy that reflects our values, not an economy that is built on our fears. And we as a legislature have a big role to play and we have miles and miles to go before we can build a society that values all families and protects all of us. And we should not be uh, satisfied to sit back and say we made some progress, uh, we, choked, we chalked up some wins and losses, uh, we can be satisfied because we stopped something or because we got some small measure passed. We have so much work to do that small gains and standing still should never be satisfactory to any of us. I believe that this is based, that, that, that the mission that we have is to build a, an economy and to build a society based on simple justice. The justice of equal opportunity and the justice of the ability to take care of your family while you're working and have that dignity. We are seeing in our society today that, that uh, when we are delaying that justice and we are denying that justice, we are creating deep divisions for all of us. We're seeing that in the Black Lives Matter protest. We're seeing that in the fight for 15. Uh, I would even give you that we're see we've seen that in the Tea Party movement. We see people who feel like society needs to make deep and structural changes in order to build a society built on justice. I think if you, if looking ahead to the next presidential race, if you would perfectly capture the mood of the electorate, the electorate if you had Elizabeth Warren in a uh, presidential contest against uh, Rand Paul. You would have the libertarians versus the populists. Those are the deep feelings of need for change and a deep sense of injustice that are driving our two parties. And I don't think any of us should be uh, satisfied with standing still where we are today. I believe that government has a profound role to play in reforming our economy 
and making our lives better. I know that we don't all agree that that role is central to improving uh, people's lives, but that is what I believe. I don't think it is right that somebody like my wife has to be one of the very fortunate few to have an employer who values her that much that they're willing to give her all that time off and pay her to take care of her family. So uh, I would just urge you to not be patient with the status quo, to not be satisfied with the next election and who wins, who losses, and who uh, plays that game, and to ask us and to ask yourself every day whether the policies that we are considering in the legislature are advancing the cause of a just society and a just economy, something that is built on the values that we share. So this is uh, my final speech to all of you. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, if you had managed to close the session on time without a special session, you wouldn't have had to hear this at all. Uh, because I intended for my final speech to be asking Representative Erdahl whether he traded uh, seats at the Hibbing High School Auditorium for the uh, portable planetarium on the last night of session and to close with that. But instead, you get to hear my final thoughts in this manner. Um, this is better. This is better? <laughs> what, did you? <laughs> he, he will not yield. <laughs> so anyway, this is the last time I speak to you as a member. I want to thank you all for uh, your uh, attention and listening to me tonight, uh, for all of the back and forth and the good debate and the policy agreements and disagreements. Uh, no, this, de this democratic process is noisy and it is uh, not for the faint of heart, and it shouldn't be because the issues are important. Uh, but rest assured, uh, all of you members, that this is not the last time you're going to hear me speaking on behalf of a just society that needs to change now and that we owe our responsibility now to build a better future for all of us. So thank you. I'm going to Kellyanne.